You're listening to The Intellectual Investor, episode number 120, interview with Andrew Horowitz, The Disciplined Investor. To learn more about Vitaly's investing firm, IMA, go to imausa.com. Interview with Andrew Horowitz, The Disciplined Investor. In this interview, Vitaly sits down with his friend, Andrew Horowitz, from the Disciplined Investor podcast. They discuss everything, from what value investing is and is not, to whether you should take the Peter Lynch approach of investing in what you know, to the future of malls and ride-sharing. Enjoy. And back with us today is our good friend Vitaly Katzenelson from, uh, well, he has a writer. He writes what's called Contrarian Edge. And uh, he is the Chief Investment Officer at Investment Management Associates, better known as IMA, which is a value investment firm in Denver, Colorado. He graduated with degrees in finance at the University of Colorado and uh, also has a CFA designation. So this is one smart cookie that we have with us today. Vitaly, how you been, buddy? Uh, it's my, it's great. It's my pleasure. I always enjoy doing your show. It's your phenomenal, phenomenal. <laughs> Thanks. Did you know, by the way, not everybody knows yeah. this, so I'm catching everybody up to this, that we are the longest running financial and investing podcast that started back in 2007. I, I can see why. I mean, you're, you're so good. I, I mean, I really mean it. I, you know, I really enjoy doing it. Every, you know, you're, pheno- you're phenomenal, phenomenal host. I, pre- <laughs> I appreciate it. Now you do a lot of writing. And you do a lot of great writing, a lot of, you know, descriptive and kind of bring a lot of other areas. And I know you're a big fan of classical music and you wrap in some of your discussions in those kinds of terms. Um, you know, you've written for what? Financial Times and Barron's and yeah. Business Week and all that. And recently you uh, wrote a few things I want to talk about. But one of the things that you do talk about quite often is and, and I don't know if it's, you know, maybe it's defensive in a way in, in some of these environments, but, you know, you write about value investing, the concept of value investing. We've talked about it before. And I yeah. thought, though, for the audience today and everybody listening that really maybe started investing recently, <laughs> that doesn't know what, what the hell's in value. What, what is that? Um, how can we actually define value investing to them? So let me give you a wrong definition first. Okay. Okay. Buying cheap stocks. Okay. Okay. Or oh, even more, even more wrong, buying statistically cheap stocks. Um, now, cheap is two different definitions, right? Cheap is like, okay, it's no, 30 cents. And cheap is that it is um, cheap to its peers. Well, no, so both actually, both. I give you both that are wrong so far. So, so far, both are wrong. Then, then I give you, let me give you the right definition. It's a, it's a philosophy where you have a certain, uh, certain uh, tenants. Like, you know, uh, let me give you one. No, uh, that you want to buy companies that are significantly undervalued, okay? Number two, uh, you treat company, uh, you treat stocks as businesses, not pieces of paper. Number three, the volatility is there to certain, you know, the, your, your true risk is not really volatility, what, you know, how the stock market decides to price a company in any specific day, but uh, permanent loss of capital. When the stock price declines, it never comes back. Because the business, you know, you know, the, the value of the business has declined. Um, number four, you you have a long-term time horizon. So your time horizon is not weeks or you know weeks or months, but years. And that again, that's going back to the fact that you're treating the companies you're buying, in the stocks you're buying, not as pieces of paper, but as businesses. In other words, you're analyzing the same way you and I would be analyzing if you were buying a private company. And there are a few more, but this is kind of, but but these are kind of the tenants of value investing, and they have absolutely nothing to do with buying statistically cheap stocks. And I think this is kind of, when people read in the uh, the intelligent investor, you know, kind of the Bible of value investing. Mm-hmm. Benjamin Graham. They yeah, Benjamin Graham exactly. They can get two things out of it. The a lot of people just get out, you know, that you know you got to buy stocks at less ten times earnings. Or it's almost like going to the you know to the to Louvre. And figuring out that the, the they have soft paper towels in their bathroom kind of thing. That's that's that, that's basically if you read this book and that's all you get out of it, that's basically that's it's kind of that kind of, you know it, it's you know it's you know it's kind of that's a very primitive insight. It's like missing the whole the whole framework. point. So let's go back yeah. though. Let's go back. So the first thing you said you have to have a long time horizon. That's the last thing you said, yeah. right? So yeah. that flies right in the face with the Adderall investor that we have right now. Right. Yeah. 
And people that are looking to, hey, I'm going to buy this stock in three days later, or very quickly, it's going to go up in value and stay up there. The other thing you talked about was how you're buying a company, not just a piece of paper. And uh, that flies into the face of the investor just looking for the quick hit on looking at not the business itself, but who cares about the business as long as it makes money, price is what pays. And you know what? Jim Cramer says it, and I'm going to buy it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the other things you talk about, you know, looking at value of it in terms of not statistically, uh, but, but, but you know, looking at it as a company and would I want this for the long haul is just not kind of the game right now. Would, would you agree with those points? Absolutely. I, I mean, I agree with you wholeheartedly because the couple of things. Um, number one, I think people look at the stock market and just because you're buying stock doesn't mean you're investing. And I think the, in fact, I would argue stock market is a lot more dangerous than Las Vegas to some, you know, because for, because the stock market could either be like a place where you invest or a place where you gamble. Okay. But here's the thing. Because people, because people, when they buy stocks, they think they're investing. Um, they may end up losing a lot more money because when you, at least when you go into Las Vegas, if you have an IQ above a potato, you know that you know that you know there's a good chance you're going to lose all this money. But in fact, the odds are against you that you're going to come back uh, with more money than you came with. Mm -hmm. so then you came there to be okay, but because. Um, when you're buying, uh, I don't know, the pick a company, because you buy Netflix and the day before you watch show on Netflix, now you think you're investing. That's, you know, if you're just buying it and treating it as a piece of paper, you're just gambling with your life savings. That's like, so, that's like going past a stop sign and it's red, walking into a casino, going to the roulette table, say, hey, I saw a red sign. I'm going to put it on red. It must be lucky. Exactly. Except, ex except when you go and when you do this with $100 in Las Vegas, you know the concept, you know, you, you, know, you, you will... If you are having, you know, again, you would probably not take your life savings and put it on red, right? But because, you know, because, you know, because people often confuse stock market with a casino. And so, and they, they, they treat it like a casino and they take the life savings and put it on red and then they wake up, they buy GameStop. And then one day they wake up and found out that they bought something, you know, paid three hundred dollars for something that's worth five dollars. But then again, on the other hand, there is the Peter Lynch strategy, which is buy what you know, right? And it's like, okay, this is. I, I think there's some truth to this, by the way. Okay, I like. Um, I'm just gonna make some things up here. I, I, I watch Netflix, and I think I, I like yeah. Netflix, and I, I would never cancel my Netflix. And they can inch me up a dollar here or there, and I'm gonna stay. Yeah. Or you know, I use Microsoft as all my products. Or I have Apple. I love my iPhone. Now, what I think about about that is not just, okay, I like it. No, probably I'm the man on the street. I'm the everyday guy. I'm doing everything that everybody else is doing. Not much different. And if I'm doing it and I have a preference towards it, unless it's something really, you know, a, a very niche kind of situation, probably everybody else is doing the same thing. Yeah. So let me give you an example. Let's say there is a restaurant right next to a house. And you go to that restaurant and you have this incredible meal and you say, my God, this place must be awesome. Okay. And I want to own it. And then you say, I'm going to write a check for $500 million for this restaurant mm -hmm. to own it. Would you do that? Just one restaurant. You would, that would be silly, right? That would be insane. Right. No matter like, you know, they really have to be, have revenues. Well, on the data, that. on the, on the data you provided me just now, no, the answer is no. I, that's exactly. Just, that's exactly. not enough well, data exactly. to go by anything. Yeah, exactly. Because it's just, you know, $500 million is a lot of money to pay for one location of a restaurant, no matter how great the food is, right? And, well, it's, it, so, unless, unless somehow it's uh, they were they were doing a trillion dollars worth of revenue. Exactly. Okay. But again, it's just your know, mom and pop store. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we know that's insane. That's just, that would be insane. It's okay. a mom and pop restaurant, let's say. Right. You know that's insane. So the price, so what I just showed you, that the price you pay, even for an incredible foie gras, whatever you are having in this restaurant, no. is matters, right? Right. So the same thing happens with the stock market. So a company may have an incredible product, and which is this is great. That's knowing that company has a great, incredible product is important. But you also need to know what is this company maybe worth because, because again, just like as a Paying uh, five hundred million dollars for a restaurant, mom and pop restaurant, is insane. Maybe paying fifty billion dollars for a company that has revenues of you know 
$50 million is insane as well. And if you look today, and I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, I don't have a concrete example to show you, but if you look at a lot of stocks that are today, that are trade, like, you know, if you look at GameStop, that is an insanity. Let's, let's not. <laughs> well, let's not. But, but you, know, you know what I mean? So if you look- Well, let me give like you this that, though. No, no, let, me, let me throw this at you. Yeah. So the mom and pop situation that you described to me is, you know, a little bit absurd and all that. But yeah. what investors are doing right now is they're taking and saying, well, you know what? Hmm. No. I wouldn't pay $500 million for a mom and pop restaurant, but the mom and pop restaurant has a quote path to profitability. Cause they put, they put this in a white paper and um, they're going to open up, you know, one in every town in the U S and we believe because when they do that, they're going to grow substantially and they can extrapolate. That's what's going on in the markets. Now this, this gigantic game of extrapolation to say that this is going to be something bigger. And you know what? Why wait to pay for it when it's so much bigger, when I can get onto it now? Isn't that what's happening? Well, that's right. But, see, but the thing is, is, you know, so the, can you imagine what this store has to do, like in this example, to, you know, how many stores they have to open for to justify this valuation and that future, how perfect it has to be? The point I'm trying to make is this. When you, when you look at this, you know, when you look at this as buying the whole business, suddenly saying $500 million for a company that generates revenue in millions, maybe, is insane. But let me give you this example. And I just literally pulled it up while we were talking, just to give you an example. All right. There's a company, and again, I have no skin in the game. I don't own the company. The only thing we use their service as a, in QuickBooks, it's a, a bill.com. So this is a company that has revenues of $160 million. And this is a company that has a market capitalization of $12.7 billion. Hmm. So this, let me ask a question. Would you pay $12.7 billion for a company that's even fast growing that has revenues of $167 million? That is a, now that's almost 100 times revenues. Right. So you'll say, probably I wouldn't. But here's the thing. If you look at it, if you just keep, if you just look at it as a piece of paper, as a stock, and say, well, build.com, I love this service, and it's $154 stock. Okay, you know, I should buy it. Do you, do you see the difference? I, the difference I'm clear between, about this, but... The problem is that you're not getting reward. Well, let me say this. Let me say it differently. Let me turn this upside yeah. down. You're getting rewarded right now to buy those kinds of things. Now, sure. I realize that there may be a catastrophe in the future, but you know what? Over the last two years, doing the job of an analyst, of doing the breakdown of the company, of looking at all the different functions and statistics, looking at the valuations and all that, I got to tell you, my friend, it's been freaking lonely, hasn't it? It, it is. And it's like, it's, it's, it, I wrote a few articles on this topic and comparing it to kind of 1999 money, money. Like in a sense in 99, the, the more you knew about investing, the less money you made. Right? <laughs> right, right. And it's kind of, it's kind of the same, right. It's going on right now because it's a, and this is a kind of a bigger point, but I think what's happening in the stock market is a manifestation and you also seen it just not in the market, but also in real estate. You seen it in um, in uh, like I have a friend who owns a trading cards store, and he has the best year he ever had. In I his heard life. there and, are some crazy prices right now for yeah. for baseball cards and other exactly. playing cards. And that's and what I would argue is just a manifestation of speculation, and and this is an important point inflation, that is making into assets. And at some point that will make it, you know, so right now it's not showing up in the price of your tomatoes, but at some point it will. And, and well, because also, people are not, the, the other thing is that people are numb to the cost of things, right? Like I could tell you, I know, and I can tell you, listen, I've been mm -hmm. at this a long time and I'll tell you something personally that, mm -hmm. um, you know, there are times that I just do my thing and I kind of throw my credit card down on a meal or something or better yet, you know, I'm out somewhere and I'll buy something. And I, th there's those moments that I just don't even care what it costs. I know that sounds mm -hmm. kind of really disgusting, but I'm sorry to say that we all have those moments, right? It's like, all right, whatever it is, you know, I'm not going to, you know, this other thing I may be really like, all right, let me get the best price on this because I need this. There's other things that are like, okay, you know what? Let me get there. I think the pan, let me just get it. The pandemic has created situations like, all right, I just went through a near-death experience. I'm probably mm -hmm. having post-virus stress disorder where <laughs> I'm nervous about going out and doing things, but I'm out already. Let me just live a little bit because you know what? 
Who knows? I keep on hearing these words variant and, and mutations, and I, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So what am I waiting for? I think there's a lot of that in the, in the environment right now. No, I think you're right. Actually, I think you should coin this term PBSD. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I think I think a lot of what's going on. But it's the, the speculation you've seen in the stock market in general right now is that when people keep making money, their time they think their time horizon is extremely long, right? They're like, oh, I'm buying this company. It's trading at $13 billion. But you know what? In 30 years, this company is going to have this revenues, et cetera. The problem is this, this time horizon as it right now is infinite. It will shrink very quickly when this company is down 30%. Yeah. So, so let me just get back to this, though, that value yes. value plays traditionally when you look at it and split the market, and especially when you're looking at ETFs and looking at yeah. sector styles and all this, usually the value is usually considered the banks, the energies, the staples, yeah. whereas the growth is your your technology, maybe consumer discretionary um, health care. Is that how you look at it? Or are there those times that you'll find a technology company? I think there was a time when IBM was on your list as hot, right? Or HP, HP, uh, no, HP, no, no, HP, no, no, HP. Never has. Uh, HP. I think beyond, beyond HP, you know, yep. beyond HP. Yeah, but yeah. what my point is that 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 yeah. kind of situation where there's a value, does that sometimes make you nervous when you see value in, a, let's say, a growth, a growth stock that becomes a quote-unquote value stock? Does that make you nervous that that could be dead money moving forward? Yeah, so there, there, there's several answers to this. Number one, remember how I started that uh, statistically cheap stocks Considered, you know, like that's, you know, there's this fallacy that, you know, this is value of growth based on how, where the price to earnings is today mm -hmm. or price to sales. So I want to be very clear about this. So if you, when you have a computing power and you have a lot of companies and you are a consultant, what you're going to try to do, you're going to try to divide universes into different buckets. You're going to, you're going to have a growth bucket. You're going to have a value bucket. And how do you know? And how do you do this? Well, you can't really do fundamental analysis on every company and say this is a value stock. This company is undervalued, right? Because there's a lot of subjectivity to that. So what you do, you say you're going to say I'm going to divide, let's say S&P 500, on price to earnings, and I'm going to take the based on that, I'm going to take uh, the the the, uh, the cheapest 250 companies that's going to be our value bucket or whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, the you know the most expensive 250 stocks they're going to be our growth bucket. So, so when you hear value versus growth kind of uh, conversation, that's what they're usually talking about. That's now how. That's not how I characterize it. Mm -hmm. Here's why. So at some point we owned Hewlett Packard when the stock was significantly undervalued to what I thought the company was worth. So so let's just stop it right there for a second. Hold on. So yeah. so valuing the company against itself, where it could be, is the value equation rather than necessarily valuing the company against statistically uh, yes. derived numbers of maybe a sector of its peers necessarily. Well, peers can come in, but of the sector itself or of the universe. Yeah. So it's, it's at the time Hewlett Packard was, had significant, was significantly undervalued what I thought the present value of its future cash flows would, you know, you know I thought would support, you know, right. Would work. right, right. So right. you see, okay. So the difference, however, I'll give you a couple examples. So last year, like a year ago, uh, we bought Uber, mm -hmm. okay? And you and I, like not a single like consultant would put Uber into uh, into in the kind of value you know, category, right? Mm -hmm. But when we analyzed Uber, by the way, and, and this is, like, you can read my 15 page analysis on like on Uber, when you, how I figured out that's a, you know, that the company was undervalued on our website. And you, and you can probably put it in the show notes if you'd like. Yep, we'll but the, uh, but here's, here's the point I want to stress. There is value in growth. In other words, when you look at a company, you know, the value of any company is a present value of its future cash flows. Right. If a company, if, if, you know, if you have a company who, whose cash flows are going to grow over the long term for a you know, full period of time, that company, that, that there is a lot of value in the, in the, you know, in the, in the, in the cash flows that will make three, five, 10 years from now. Right. Mm -hmm, right. And th so therefore, so therefore, when we looked at Uber, we thought the company was undervalued because it was about to go from, you know, this was before pandemic, like we bought it a month before pandemic, mm -hmm. but it's still true for them today. It was going to go from the point where it was losing money to break even because it got to scale. And, and then at this point, they're going to start making a lot of money. And because 
once they're at scale, every dollar of revenue comes with very, very high margin, incremental margin. And in our analysis, we thought Uber was undervalued. Even though I am a value investor, and even though Uber does not look statistically cheap based on earnings of 2010, of 2020 or 2022, but on the earnings you know, that you know, we felt very strongly about of 2026, they were significantly undervalued. Isn't that how a lot of people are valuing Tesla, though, in, in a way? They're looking at the future and looking at uh, the, the, well, again, looking at it when it was maybe $300, $400, yeah. uh, maybe even pre-split $400, and the stock just ran up. I mean, is it is it that same situation where you could look at a growth company potentially in the future? I mean, that, it's kind of splitting hairs in a way, I think. Well, because is Uber okay, even so, is so Uber they, profitable so, so, now? Is Uber profitable yet? Uh, well, they they basically gonna be profitable by the end of this year. Yes, right. They're gonna be profitable. They, the but they realized like, pandemic. You know, okay, pandemic I'll give you the pandemic. Was, but now their stock prices also ran up dramatically you, ahead of all that's that. That's right. And that, to there and and and, and uh, what's interesting actually, and this is by the way, this applies not just to Uber but a lot of companies today. Pandemic may actually has benefited uh, a lot of companies because it allowed them to take out costs, which they would have a hard time taking out when things were going well. Like right. when morally, the company was doing by well. the way, morally that's why because now they got yeah cover. exactly. Right. Uber basically laid off one quarter of its workforce, which it had to do this because it was you know too you know it just got too fat. Uh, but it would have been very difficult politically, internally politically, to do this. You know, if and now they and be- now what they do is they a lot of companies. This is interesting. This is an interesting point here because I want to exp- explore this for you with you a second because mm-hmm. I think our listeners really need to understand something here. What has mm-hmm. happened during the pandemic has allowed for a lot of companies to do things that were probably considered like uh, taboo, and then talk about how they're going to bring people back, but at the same time, run the business as efficiently as possible without that employee base, for example, or cost. So take, for example, a lot of companies have said, you know, we don't have to have all these people working in the office anymore. The savings of electricity for lighting and heating and cooling, yeah. for possibly lunches, the, the cost for office space itself, or maybe transportation that was paid for to the office, phone lines, people are using their cell phones. Maybe there's a slight reimbursement. All these things, yeah, they pick up some costs for Zoom and they pick up some costs for other things. But basically, there's a tremendous amount of savings that really came into play here with this Mm -hmm. stay at home and why some companies are like, you know what, Eh, maybe we won't have all these people back to the office. So, so I agree with you 100%, but let me, let me take it as looking from a slightly different perspective. Think about this. Before the pandemic, we were in the year nine or 10, right, or something over economic expansion. Right. We haven't had a recession in a long, long time. And recessions are basically kind of a cleansing mechanism where companies basically go on a diet and clean, you know, get, get rid of the extra fat. This pandemic was this kind of this super induced recession, right? Yeah. Which allowed them to kind of to slim very, very quickly. So when we come, when we come out, out of this, like if you look at Uber and let's say the revenues come back to pre-pandemic level, mm-hmm. their earnings are going to be just much higher just because they took out costs. And right. you can, you know, you can take this example and, you know, and basically across you know, a lot of companies in, in, the, in, in the U.S. and probably globally today. So that's, you know, th- so that's, you know, so, you know, so, you, so that's point is extremely, extremely important, I, I think. So how do I, how do I then go one step further here and look at something that's been kind of bugging me? Um, yeah. There's a company called Planet Fitness. You, you know this company, Planet Fitness? It's I know of them. It's, it's uh, they own gyms, right? Right. Yeah. So pandemic yeah. basically destroyed the company. The Peloton and gyms at home are crushing the chance yeah. for recovery. Um, the earnings suck. Their outlook suck. Recently uh, had earnings that were like not so good. Um, yeah. Stock recently hit just at an all time high. I mean, what kind of yeah. what kind of monkey is investing in this? So this it's you know I've been. I've been thinking a lot about this because what you really want to figure out if the pandemic has structurally changed our behavior in like in this category, right? So like I'll give you one example and this is like just like the only, I'm going to have full disclosure, we own the company, but you know, but I just want to walk you through our thinking about this. Mm-hmm. So we own a company, Tango Outlets, which, yep. you know, basically yep. own you know, a lot of outlet malls, right? And so on one side, if you think about what pandemic did, 
it has moved a lot of sales online. At the same time, it has destroyed JCPenney, uh, Macy's, the shrink in their store count. A lot of stores going out of business. And so our thinking was, well, would Tinger benefit from pandemic or has our behavior has changed and now and then, therefore they will get hurt by this? And what we figured out that in their case, in the case of Tinger, they are actually net beneficiary from this because on some, in some cases, we're going to buy more things online, but in some cases, and this, you know, I can't, this is something that we'll never understand, but, but, but this is because I'm a male and, you know, and I, I don't like going to stores, but I think some people really enjoy going to stores and for them, that is their pastime. That is like for like, you know, some people it's like, like me, it's like me at a buffet, it's like, like me at a buffet, yeah, me going to a buffet. Yes, you know, exactly. So some people like going in. So now, so now, if you are looking to buy brands, if you want to, you know, if you want to buy brands, um, you, you know, the the options in the in this, you know, the options are, you know, uh, the number of malls have shrunk, and number of uh, department stores have shrunk. So now, actually, I would argue in this case, Tinker may be a net beneficiary of this, even though. It, at the same time, there will be more shopping done online. So right. I look at it case by case, and uh, yeah, and I'm questioning like, would you know, would we would we come back to movie theaters or not? And I and I and I really don't have a good answer for this. And I think this is one of those things that you know, uh, in the, maybe in three, you know, two years, a year, a year from now, that you know, that will normalize and we start going to movies again. Except if and again, I well, cruises I are really, a good example. Cruise lines and airlines are a really good example too. The same thing. Exactly. And, and I can't people, wait to travel. Well, I like, understand. I, I get it. And so that behavior hasn't changed, right? Right. But but at the same but at the same time, uh, some of the business travel will probably go away because now you, you know you say like like uh, I'll give an example, perfect example. In the past, you have the you know this uh, investment houses put up this. Uh, uh, conferences, yeah, you know, put up mm -hmm. these conferences. Mm -hmm. In the past, all the all of them would be done in person, and I would argue maybe be one third or half of them in the future will be done, you know, through Zoom or etc. Because I found that actually the experience is actually even better. Yeah, but it, the so, problem is you can't get the hookers and coke delivered. No, that, okay, that's, that's the problem. Yeah, yeah, well, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> get the arguments there. Yeah. But, hey, let me um, let me let me, but, let me skip ahead to something here because you wrote another article called uh, "Covet Your Neighbor's." Go ahead, covet your neighbor's wife. And I'm not exactly sure, to be honest with you, when I read it, what I was supposed to get out of this, except unless you were being a little tricky and having me read between the lines here. And oh, there was there was no between the lines there at all. Well, what I, I got out of it was it was kind of like FOMO in the markets. You know, the whole idea of, you know, you see something over there and you want it, but maybe you can't have it. But what you do is kind of like, um, I'm seeing everybody else do it, so I want it. I'm jealous of it. I'm going to go and I'm going to just invest. I don't know. Somehow I got twisted up in this. I don't know it why. Has, actually, it's kind of funny. It's a, like, I write a, probably one third of my articles now have absolutely nothing to do with the market. And this one, this one, I had absolutely nothing to do with the market. No, so I made me, it some, let, but let I made it something to do with the market because there are the market, premise. there are market lessons in everything, right? There are market lessons in everything we do. And I'm, that, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure there is a lesson there too. Yes. So what I'm saying is, I mean, it is kind of like this big FOMO environment right now, where, um, yes, there is trend following, and you can look at the energy stocks and other stocks and value and some of the things you're talking about uh, that have come into play right now, but. Um, uh, anyway, something, something there. All right, let me switch up. From a value investor standpoint, what's your take on crypto? Can you even, I, can you I even don't. for a second, try to come up with a reason why it's good? Um, uh, I, I, I really like. So here is, here is. Yeah, I. It's almost became like a crypto became a religion now, and having discussion about it is that like it's like it's almost like there's no point. Uh, so here's how I look at this. If somebody wants to own it and put a some tiny fraction of their net worth into it, that the net the, the, amount, the amount they would would be okay losing, I have no problem with that. As an investor, I have absolutely zero value to add there except this: I can't own it because, and this is a true story. I had a friend who called me. He said I have a, and this was a two months ago, a million dollars of Bitcoin. And he said, I put $600 into it 10 years ago, and now I have no idea what to do. Because 
if it declines, it would be a lot of money for me. But if I get get out of it now, then yeah, what if it doubles? Oh, or, or taxes, triples? yeah. Yeah, and well, and the uh, the irony of that was that was two months ago, and since then it's probably tripled. Um, you know, but so so I had no idea what to tell them. The same way I have no idea what to tell them now. So I just don't have the uh, I really don't have an insight. But can we go back to the the neighbor's wife for a second because I uh, think yeah. it's really I'm still, I'm still covering her. Even, still covering her. Yeah, yeah. No, let, let me tell you the story. So this is what happened. I was talking to a good friend of mine. And we we had this kind of deep conversation, and he's and uh, and uh, and I asked him, "Would you want to have Buffett's success? Warren Buffett's success?" He mm -hmm. says, "You said he said is, is that a rhetorical question?" I said, "No." He said, "Yes, of course I would." And then I and then I, and the, this uh, you know you and I are Jewish, and my my wife is uh, very deeply religious, and she told me this story which I thought was phenomenal. It's a in the again I'm not getting too too philosophical, but in the in the Jewish religion they have this concept where if you're gonna covet, if you're gonna covet, you know, if you're gonna basically jealous of something or what somebody else is, somebody else has, mm -hmm. you want to do it in entirety. In other words, if you have this, if your neighbor has this beautiful wife that you really, you know, uh, admire from afar, and you really want to covet her, do it in the in the entirety. In other words, imagine that that wife comes with the you know with a mother. Who's gonna? Every time you see her, she wants to keep you on the lips. And there's a brother who probably spends every other week in jail. And that wife <laughs> is gonna pay a lot less attention to you than you think. Mm -hmm. All this. So after you imagine all this, do you still have? You know. So in other words, if you cover, do it in entirety. Right. right. So just don't do it after her body. But think about, hey, you're gonna have to adopt her kids. You're gonna have to deal with the mother-in-law. You know. Every, and, all, and, and she's gonna want all these Birkin bags. She's gonna want to buy and all the diamonds. And is that exactly. what you want? Before you make so the final after, decision. After you do this, mm -hmm. you may not want to cover it as much, right? Which means, and so, that translates in, if the, all that the work Buffett has to do and all that, maybe I don't want that success. Exactly. And in the, in the case with Buffett was kind of interesting because his success came at an incredible personal cost. And this is what I was talking about. His, his wife, you know, and this is, you know, the when I read the Snowball by Alice Schroeder, that book had a, such a huge impact. It's a kind of authorized biography on Buffett, right? Because basically he gave you access to everything. See, so he, he allowed all of his friends to talk to her, et cetera. And this book, you know, I'm, a, I'm, so, I'm this diehard value investor. I read this, you know, I read this 500 page book about Buffett. And the most important point I got out of this is not to be like Buffett. Mm -hmm. And because his wife, who was the love of his life, left him, you know, left him. His because and his kids basically, you know, he uh, at the end of his life, you know, uh, lately he you know, he felt like uh, he didn't spend enough time with his kids. Yeah, a little late. And and well, lately I mean, like, I mean, like in his seventies, I guess, eighties. Right. But right. you know, he did not know about this at the time because basically he dedicated all his life to investing, and he was an absent father, an absent uh, husband. And that's when I say, so when you look at Buffett and his success, I say, look at this, this entirety. Do you really want to have a hundred billion dollars that you're going to give away anyway, or that he's going to give away anyway, even if you don't, at this cost? And that was really the point of the article to me. Which I think, by the that's, way, has been further cemented in by this, um, by the pandemic and the realization of, is there more to life? You know, that's exactly right. So, uh, yeah, Andrew, I'm, I'm right. It's kind of just, and then we, you know, we can switch to different topic. But I was going to tell you, I'm right. I'm just finishing the book right now, and it's going to come out uh, in uh, August. Oh, it has. It's called Soul in the Game. Soul in the Game. It, yeah, Soul in the Game, and this book does not have a single article about. You no, know, it's this book is completely not about investing, and it's not about we, sneakers with Nike. It's S O U L, not S O L E. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> S O yes, yes, yeah. It, this is my beautiful Russian accent. Yeah, still in a game. Uh, but but the, the point I'm trying to make is that to me, non-investment topics like what we you and I just talked about mm -hmm. are as dear to me now, and maybe maybe as I got older, than you know, kind of the value investing. Yeah, I hear you. I hear. You. We got to wrap it. Vitaly Katzenelson. We're going to put all the information on the website. I know you have a great newsletter. You have a great following. Um, we're going to put all the information on how to get in touch with you, all the information. And of course, once the book comes out, let me know, send, please send me a copy. Uh, and, um, we will, uh, catch up on the other side of that. So I can take a look and discuss, uh, 
the 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 idea that you have and 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 uh, some of the other ideas you have in the future. I really appreciate your time. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, right. Again, you're phenomenal. Thank oh, you. thanks. You too, buddy. Thanks. How nice is Vitaly with those compliments? That makes me feel really good. Thank you for listening. This and other investment articles by Vitaly Katzenelson are based on value investing principles that were first brought down from the mountain by Benjamin Graham and later were popularized by Warren Buffett. To learn more about these principles, visit Investor.fm and listen to the first episode of this podcast titled The Six Commandments of Value Investing. To learn more about how Vitaly's investment firm uses these principles to create low-risk, long-term oriented portfolios, visit imausa.com. Enjoy life and prosper.